to set up organizational and architectural growth uh, with Mark Landman, Managing Director at Dot Control. Mark, welcome to the stage. Hi. Hi, Brian. Thank you. How are you doing today? Yeah, pretty okay. Thanks. Awesome. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna delay things any further. I'm gonna let you have the stage and uh, and share some insights with us. Thanks so much. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So today I'm gonna uh, take you along um, on our journey on uh, on growth. Uh, let me see if my slides are working. This is me. I'm Mark Lundman, managing a partner at uh, at Dot Control. Um, this is like a small recap of a larger deck. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit and uh, get you through this in 20 minutes. If you want to see like the full edition, uh, please drop me an email or, or a chat and, and then I can send you like the full edition. Just a small, inter small introduction. At Dot Control, we build ambitions. Uh, basically, we realize the positive future for people, brands, and organizations. That's what we do. Uh, we were in commerce and digital products and in communication. And then we merge creativity, data, and technology to create basically customer journeys but then customer journeys with a touch. Uh, but don't be afraid, this is not going to be a sales pitch uh, because we don't have the time for that. Um, <clears throat> today, we're gonna talk about growth. So how are we going to enable growth um, within your organization? How are we going to uh, grow the organization? Uh, uh, basically, we all know that uh, the gold is out there somewhere, uh, but how can we find it and how can we mine it? So how can we create results with all the beautiful work we are uh, we are making, all the beautiful digital work we are making. So basically, how can we execute sustainable growth? That's, that's the question of the day. Well, basically at Dot Control, we learned that system thinking in all areas is our key to growth. And uh, I'm gonna explain a little bit more about system thinking later on, but that's our key because, well, I think in a lot of cases, this is sometimes how we feel uh, working in dev, working in, uh, on the creative side, maybe working in marketing, or actually this is what we want to feel. Uh, excited about the results we're making. Uh, and for that, I think we've learned uh, a thing or two on how we can approach this to make sure that we all feel like this. And that's a systematic way of uh, data-driven marketing and development. Uh, so by listening, testing, and validating, and then onwards to go. Today is not only about uh, the marketing and, and uh, marketing side. I'm also going to touch, of course, on the architecture side, because that's what I promised also in uh, the title. For that, we have a model. We call it the seven pillars of data-driven growth. So basically, how do we build this growth system? Uh, well, first, it all starts with mindset and team. You need the right team with the right mindset uh, to get the growth going. Uh, without that, we cannot develop, we cannot build, we cannot execute. Uh, onwards, we need to listen to our market. Then we need to build those systems and get the right architecture in place. For, uh, based on that, we can define our, our strategy, our product strategy. Uh, based on that, we can achieve product market fit. Only then we can have traction and then we can start the optimization so we can have lift off towards more growth. Let's start with the first one, mindset. Basically, um, digital is not that complex. Um, it's all about people. Digital is a pool medium made by people for people. The only thing is that sometimes we're very product driven instead of people driven um, on the development side. So how we set up the teams, but also with the focus on the things we do for people. And then it's only product thinking instead of people thinking. I think this is a crucial thing if we set up correct teams uh, that we keep people in mind. Um, so the end user, but also how we set up a team to be successful in uh, developing, developing this product. This all starts with mindset. So basically we define two mindsets, the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. And I think this is not going to be a surprise, but we need the growth mindset in our team. Um, here you see some differences between people with a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Uh, maybe some things on the right hand side uh, you might have come up with in, in real day life. Um, uh, but if we've learned that if we set up a team together with the client, so the growth mindset also needs to be on the client side. Uh, that's the true foundation to uh, overcome like all the challenges and also be successful. And then if we, we zoom a little bit deeper, we see that a growth mindset on skills um, uh, is envisioned as it comes from hard work. When it, uh, a growth mindset on challenges, which we will face, uh, is, that, is that we embrace challenges. It's especially crucial when it comes to client work because um, uh, an open-minded client with a growth mindset who embraces challenges really gives you the freedom and the foundation uh, to become more, uh, to grow more. Then effort, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very essential Feedback is very useful and setbacks, well, they need also need to embrace their wake up call and they're uh, especially not something to blame others. This provides like the foundation for, for a good culture. A second thing is that when we build a team together with the client, there's no room for ego in a data driven world. So we need to get the opinions out. If we really want to listen to people from data, but also uh, by talking to people and we want to develop uh, stuff that really creates this pool, um, we don't need to go uh, around the ego. 
uh, we see that so we don't we cannot handle any divas in this world onwards if we set up the team uh we think it's more important that we uh, take a look at personality over skills of course we need the best craft developers um the best designers um the best uh, project managers the best client but uh when it comes down uh to the actual work uh and that, uh, that we have a team successfully running uh we think that personality is more important than skills so based on that we uh try to balance personalities in teams and we do that based on uh, the Colby personality test. Uh, that's a, a character test in which, uh, and, and it distincts uh, four different character types. So there's the fact finder, the follow through person, the quick starter and the implementer. I think the names uh, already uh, give away what they are. Uh, basically the fact finder is the, the person who really tries to deep dive, uh, deep dive and get all the details in. The follow through person is the person who pushes through. The quick starter is the guy who takes the, the most risk or guy or girl who takes the most risks and um, uh, try to move as fast as he can. And the implementer try to really to, re to, to renovate and envision. And if you want to create like a good team, you need to combine all those different personalities uh, into, into the team to make sure that you do it. you're not only uh, fact finding, uh, but also not only quick starting. And also, it's also important on the, on, the, on the client side that you also see what personality the client side is having to make sure that you balance your team out to also handle the right characteristics. Only then the rest can become successful. So then we have a team with a great culture, with the right mindset. Um, but how does this function? Well, we see a lot of organizations in which it works like this, a broken silo system. So the product team, the marketing team, and the sales team are separated with their own agenda, their own KPIs, and their own goals. And basically what we want is to have one growth system, basically a group, multidisciplinary growth team in place in the center um, with this dev uh, on the, on the left-hand side, marketing and product uh, down below, combining all these insights and also making sure that the things we learn on the marketing side or the things we are implementing on the marketing side also directly flow to product or directly to dev. One, a really central place. Then it comes to pillar number two. So now with the right team in place, what about systems? Well, I you're thinking what is a system um uh, a system uh, is a thing that can uh, only a system can be continuously improved so if you want to grow and if you want to come better every day so if you want to create a better architecture every day we cannot run on an ad hoc environment we need to have a system in place but what exactly is a system so if we really narrow it down a system is a documented step-by-step -step process on how to do something the system is repeatable and the system is scalable. So basically, because we write it down, we can repeat it. And because of that, it's also scalable. So, and if we put it down in everything we do, then we get a machine which we can optimize constantly. Then we have a great team with a great mindset, with a very flexible setup combined in a very stable world. Here's a small example. For instance, an airliner, let's say it's a budget airliner. You can only fly to Barcelona from Rotterdam where I'm standing for 85 euros because of all the systems the systems are everywhere it's it's how they load the plane how they fuel the plane how they sell the tickets how they book the plane how they fly the plane uh, and due to that they can optimize it uh, because basically uh, driving an airplane is uh, quite money intensive um, and they can only optimize it uh, due to the fact that all the systems in place and if you can copy that to our digital environment so take a system approach in everything we do we can optimize it become more efficient and grow so we need the system mindset behind, uh, besides the growth mindset. The, the system mindset says that everything is a system. So if we collaborate, we can systematize everything. If we documentate things, it gives, our, it gives us freedom because we can hand it over. For instance, in development, um, if we uh, create great documentation, make then we have stability, but we can also scale up the team while maintaining the quality. Every system can be improved or only a system can be improved. And without a system, there's no hacking. You cannot attack anything uh, or improve anything if it's not a system because then you're doing random things. And action is the only way to find a system. Um, it's not a, a very good thing to just start and designing a system. Basically, it's the other way around. First act, then documentate, and then you will find a system. It's a, a way faster way to move. Then the architecture. So now we have the system uh, mindset in place, we have the systems in place, and we also have a great team in place. But we also need a great architecture to support this growth system. We need a flexible architecture, a scalable architecture, um, because otherwise uh, we do not have a system which we can adopt fast. And of course, we all know that in the past with great monoliths, um, it was quite hard uh, to scale up on the architectural side because you were bound to the platform. 
But I think these days things are changing. And due to that, we come to, into a more flexible world, uh, which provides us better services, we can connect. And due to that, we can grow faster. So this is how we see, for instance, the future of commerce. Uh, if we want to grow, uh, I've taken commerce as an uh, example uh, because that's uh, uh, transactional. Uh, a transactional platform is easier to grow than uh, only a second content platform. And this is what we see happening on the commerce side. Well, first of all, we see that CX is becoming everything. Uh, I think that the move from a traditional CMS to a headless CMS is not a surprise to you. Um, but we do think it, it's very crucial not only from a development perspective uh, and a performance perspective, but also from a user perspective. With a, a, a headless environment, uh, a decoupled environment, we're able to create better brand experience for the user. Uh, and when it comes to, for instance, direct to consumer experience uh, or commerce, where you want to really uh, bring the brand to life, um, uh, headless CMSs or a headless setup provides you, the, provides you the freedom to do that while also maintaining a lot of stable functionality on the backend side. This also has a lot of advantages, for instance, on search, uh, let's say uh, SEO, SEA, uh, due to also to the performance uh, setup of this. So the first thing, CX is really becoming everything. The second thing is what we see is that uh, we used to work with loosely coupled architectures, um, which meant that we had APIs for all different services connecting every platform to every platform uh, and maybe sometimes ending up in a, a big pot of spaghetti. Your internal apps connect to your cloud apps, your advertiser to your messaging, um, uh, a lot of APIs uh, flying around and also a lot of challenges. Well, we see the following thing happening is that we're moving to event streaming. Basically, uh, all your apps are connecting to one central event streaming platform, um, uh, which collects all the events uh, and then also based on that triggers other events to inform other platforms around. This provides us a better structure, a better system, uh, a more stable platform to make sure that we can provide a better end user functionality and at the end of the day, a bigger smile at the, at the end user. Another thing which is really important is to have a data proof um, a strategy in place, a good solid data strategy. Everything runs in data. Uh, and when we uh, go back like three slides, you saw that this loosely decoupled um, architecture, then it's very hard to get all your data in one place. While if you move to a new architecture with a solid data structure, you can uh, you get ownership of all your data, all your data in place, and then you can also really ideate, prioritize, and optimize based, based on that. This all comes down to uh, what we uh, what, what's called the, the MAG architecture, microservice oriented architecture. This is all where also where the graph CMS lives uh, as a, as a, as a service. Uh, in this case, you will use different services, so different microservices for each specific uh, functionality which you can also swap, uh, uh, swap in between or improve or uh, replace um, on different patterns. And due to that, you get a very flexible, but also scalable and stable environment. You're not reliant on one big monolith anymore, uh, but you can get the best CMS you want, the best search provider, the best payment provider, the best loyalty program. And uh, down there, there's uh, the data layer. The data layer, based on your data architecture, then provides the service bus or the message broker which uh, also brings all the data messages uh, towards the PIM, the OMS, the DOM, et cetera. And due to that, there's one single source of truth when it comes to data. There's ownership of all the data. You get the flexibility to swap around all the service you want to, and also not, the, not the, the, the hosting environment you need to maintain on a monolith side. And you've got the freedom on the front end side to create a great, great CX. And this provides you this architecture which supports your system thinking combined with a great team and sets you free um, uh, to grow. So now we have an architecture, a system mindset and a great team in place. Now we need to define the product that starts with listening to your market. The reason why most startups are failing uh, is not that they run out of cash. And it's not only for startups, but also for business plans. Um, it's not that the budget runs out. But basically, because there's no market need, we're selling sand in the desert. Uh, that's uh, quite often something that, uh, that happens. And the funny thing is, it's not, not the case that we're so much off, but we're maybe sometimes a bit off. And uh, as I showed you in the previous slides, it's all about the user and it's all about people and their need. So first we need to define, okay, who's our target customer group and what are exactly their pains? So which problem are we solving for who? For that, we use personas, but then based on data. Uh, we do uh, data research, uh, and then based on that, we define these different personas. Normally, that's the starting point, and then onwards, you go directly into product. But there's a step in between, and that's what that's called the product desire map. 
<clears throat> so basically capture the exact voice of the of the customer with a, with the focus on the exact word so basically what are the hopes and dreams what does your customer want to attain the pains and fears what are your customers waiting to avoid or get away from and the barriers and uncertainties what's preventing or getting in the way what the customers want so if we really know the customers then we can flip it around and basically there's only one lesson a product is nothing more than a solution to a problem so what we need to do we need to find the exact problem of the users and uh, and then flip it around so what you can see for instance uh, when it comes to transportation uber is just a better solution to get from a to b or instagram is just a better solution to capture meaningful moments uh, in the past it used to be kodak and for uber it used to be a horse so now we have uh, we, we know who, what what we want to sell to who uh, we defined our architecture uh, now it's onwards to strategy when we have all these insights, it starts with creative, creative concept. Um, you cannot create a, a creative concept without any data or without, without any insights, because then you're um, um, uh, then you're only making. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I was looking. I was looking at at, at the chat. Um, um, so we start. We need to do the creative concepting based on data. We start to design our solution, and we need to validate it with the market before we start to develop. Because because otherwise we're building something, spending a lot of money on assumptions, and then we end up at the top of the graph I just showed you. When we've created this creative concept, this new product, this service, um, and we want to grow, we need focus. And that's what we call a one metric that matters. What's our definition of growth? How can we measure our growth? And also um, to deliver the value of the end user. For instance, in Nespresso, the one metric that matters with Nespresso is not around selling coffee machines. The one metric that matters for Nespresso is selling coffee cups uh, because that's a scalable model. It's a repeatable model. And it also displays uh, delivering value to the end user. Great coffee. Um, that's a great one metric that which can also display your growth. And when you take a look at the strategy, you want to grow fast. Um, you also need to have a strategic framework which suits you. So if you're like a big elephant, uh, you can use larger strategic frameworks. But if you're a mouse with a higher heartbeat moving faster, you need a lightweight strategic framework to support you. So for that, for growth. So basically every organization has its own heartbeat or pulse. If you're growing fast, your pulse needs to be high. And the size and pace determines the speed of that pulse. And so we need something lightweight to keep it manageable. For that, uh, we're using scaling up the Vern Harness methodology. I would really advise it. It's a very, very lightweight uh, structure um, to organize and provide strategic, uh, a strategic background uh, to build your growth. Uh, it all uh, captures everything in a one page strategic plan, which you can handle very easily in, in the pulse every week, every day, every month. Um, uh, and due to that, you have like this very solid strategic framework and on the background, to support your growth ambitions and to really bring this product to life. When we zoom a little bit, a little bit deeper on the strategy side, um, um, we need to define our big, hairy, audacious goal. So our big goal way beyond very, very far. From that down, we, we zoom down to five years, to one year and a quarter. What's very crucial is that based on, and that's why also why we love it, uh, this methodology runs on data. So everything that's measured gets done. It runs on KPIs. Um, and due to that, you can connect every strategic action you're going to take towards this one metric, towards this uh, big, big, hairy, audacious goal, which provides your system thinking. It provides data into your, uh, um, into your background. It brings you focus um, day by day. So now we have the strategy in place. Now we need to achieve product market fit. Product market fit is achieved uh, when more than 40% of your users will be very disappointed if they can't use your product or service anymore. So basically, if you have this very, very great uh, architecture in place and you've designed this very, very great product, uh, but based on assumptions and still your users are saying um, that 40% of the users will be, uh, that 20% uh, of the users will be, will be very disappointed, then you still don't have product market fit. And later on, I will show you why this product market fit is so important. The service or products, uh, and it's also around the definition of a product. Uh, a product is not only your web shop, not only your website. Um, it's the service or product that you deliver, including all touch points with your client over its entire lifetime. So you can have great product market fit for, let's say, a year. But then onwards, if you have like a very sloppy uh, customer service, you can lose this product market fit. And especially in digital, 
when it's a pool medium, product market fit is extremely crucial to support your growth because otherwise you're onboarding new clients, you're growing your platform, um, but on the other hand, you're losing your clients because you don't have the product market fit and then that slows your growth. For that, we take a look at R, the pirate metrics. Basically, that's the customer journey. You have the acquisition phase of new users, the activation phase, the revenue phase, retention and referral. And this is where the product market fit comes into play. Acquiring new traffic, um, acquiring new users um, is easy. Uh, with a good SEO um, strategy or a social strategy, you, or you can buy or attain uh, new users. Activating them on your platform, so getting to know your users is also doable. Uh, but then if you do not have product market fit, they will not spend money with you, they will not stay with you, and they will not uh, give, give solid referrals. And referrals are crucial when it comes to growing your, your digital platform. So for that, we need the product market fit. We need to make sure that at least 40% of the users are extremely happy with the product we're offering. And for that, we need this solid architecture and we need this, this growth team with this growth mindset to constantly keep working in a very high pace to provide this, this, this solution to the problem to the end user. When we narrow it all down, it comes down to conversion. People wanting to buy or people wanting to subscribe or people wanting to stay with you. And they will only do what you want them to do, convert, if the desire they have is higher than the fiction you're offering them. Um, so what we need to do, we need to boost the desire by relevancy, making sure that the, that the pool comes in. And we need to lower the friction by providing fast working, very flexible, very scalable, uh, very user friendly, but also very appealing solutions to them. And for that, the mock architecture is a great structure because it can provide you this great structure um, um, to support this desire while reducing the friction, improving the conversion rate. But where is this product market fit? <clears throat> well, we need to find what we call the aha moment. The aha moment is the moment when your customer really understands your product and the value it has to him or her. Uh, and you want to have this as soon as possible in, this, in the customer journey in your platform. Um, and there are a couple of options. Um, well, first, uh, we need to find the friction. So if, because if we get the friction out, then we get the aha moment in place. Some examples uh, from some fast growing organization, Dropbox knows that if you put at least one file in one folder on one device, you're hooked. Um, that's what they call the hook point. That's the aha, mo aha moment from there. And from that point on, the R funnel will also start to work. If we take a look at Twitter, uh, Twitter knows that if you follow 30 plus persons, um, you will stay hooked to Twitter. And for that, uh, they do everything in the first phase of the customer lifecycle to make sure that you follow this 30 plus persons. On Slack, Slack knows that if there are 2,000 messages sent between a team, uh, the team is hooked and uh, Slack will stay in. So basically, we need to optimize the product and the journey so that they will reach frictionless product market fit. That's what we're trying to attend. But how are we going to acquire and also retain this, uh, the, these groups? Then it comes down to traction channels. There are 19 different traction channels. And a traction channel is a place where we can systematically uh, so not one-off, but systematically engage with our target customer group in a measurable, sustainable, but also effective way. Well, these are all the 19 traction channels. I'm not going to handle them one by one. But the funny thing is you can also combine them. That's what we call channel stacking. And with channel stacking, we combine different channel checks, different, different, different channels with system thinking into a marketing system. So basically, we provide first the system thinking in the architecture, the system thinking in the product your e-commerce environment, your digital app, uh, whatever kind of product we are, we are creating. Um, then onwards, we go on with the system thinking, but then with the channels connecting to the different, uh, to your product. Um, and by stacking them on top of each other, we create like customer journeys. That's not only in the acquisition phase, but also maybe for customer retention or for referral mechanisms, but in a systematic, systematic way. So not a one-off campaign, which is fine, for instance, for Black Friday or the holiday season, um to boost your sales um uh, but it, it's more important to have to to raise the bar all out the year uh, by making sure you have like this system in place which you can constantly attack and improve and then it comes down to optimization so with the product the system the team the architecture we have product market fit we're growing but we want to go faster then it's down to optimization <clears throat> so we optimize over uh, the pirate metrics 
uh, and we do this with the growth process. So basically you can expand, if you're running on Agile, I think a lot of you will be acquainted with that. You can expand your growth team, make it multidisciplinary as I showed you in team with this growth process. In every sprint, they start with ideation, come up with new ideas on things we can improve in the product also over the whole, or over, or over the whole journey. This is also uh, ideal when it comes to, for instance, this MAH architecture with flexible services, because due to that, you're more flexible to test new things or optimize things um, because your presentation layers is also like separate. Then based on that, you prioritize which new tests or hacks are going to bring me uh, further towards my growth goal. Then we can test and implement them and we can analyze them. At dot control, what we do is we do every sprint, the ideation and the prioritization for the next sprint. And we, and we, we test and analyze uh, for the previous sprint. And this cycle goes on and on and on. And what you want is to get like this, the highest phase you can get. And for that, you need like this multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary growth team, your developers and your designers, your growth marketing, marketers working side by side to make sure you can push forward in a very high pace. How do we optimize? Well, basically we have a value proposition. The, 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 the solution we're trying to solve, your product. Um, we make sure that we grow by increased relevancy and the clarity towards your end user and make sure we get out the, the, the distraction and anxiety. We can push a little bit more by using, for instance, urgency mechanisms in that case. But if you take a look at your, uh, your customer journey and your product with this in mind, make sure, okay, I've got this product, I've got this website, this web shop, uh, this app. Um, I, I need to make sure that it's more relevant, it's more clear. Or is there any distraction or anxiety in there and get it out these are these are basically the foundation of the, of the ideation process and then prioritize them to what's bringing you the most growth or the most success um, and then you can get the lift off then onwards you can go into a maturity model from manual to more automated to more integrated to predictive and in this case you see also your grow um, going up um, but growth is not like a, an exponential curve it's a stack of linear curves um, and for that you need, you need a system you can only grow faster um, if you have the system in place you can optimize because otherwise the manual work or the ad hoc work is holding is holding you back it's also very important to combine all elements into this model so there are the tools there's the brand there's the strategy there's the team uh, and of course product development only if you combine these things based on a system, you can get from a manual uh, world into a more automated world and from a more automated world into a more integrated and even onwards to predictive and AI. It doesn't make any sense to start directly with AI-driven marketing or uh, an extremely heavy architecture if you do not have the team with the maturity in place or that your tools are not mature enough or your product is not, not mature enough. And what, what we see a lot of happening is a more scattered uh, world where some of the parts within the growth system are manually done and some of the parts are more integrated and even there are ambitions to go predictive, but you need to go step by step because otherwise the system will break and your growth will drop. So basically we will keep finding the gold if we keep the focus on the system. We need to change fast and with the right team, with the right mindset and the right architecture, but always with people and their pains in mind. Okay, nice, but how can you take off tomorrow? Well, what's the first plunge? Some small takeaways. Uh, what well, you could start by analyzing your current system, maybe see if there's already a system in place and based on that, start building in a very systematic approach. The second thing is with small system changes, you can identify and implement tomorrow. So no big trajectory, no big program, but step for step, step by step. And then you can see if you can double down the amount of experiments meant to run. Can you uh, keep up the pace or can you increase the pace step by step by step every week and then uh, grow towards this growth system mindset and growth system world? Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, we do have a question in in chat. Uh, we are uh, at time, so I, I want to let people know that they can go into the into the networking room and that there is the coffee break happening right now. Uh, there was a question uh, about if the techniques for product market fit validation used by large established organizations uh, the same as what you would use in a younger startup, uh, but also what techniques do you usually use in dot control for that? Um, there's, a, there's a combination and we'll, there, there are two questions. Well, first of all, uh, no, the techniques are not the same uh, because in larger organization, also the audience uh, or the target customer group is also bigger. Um, so to get more significancy on that side, you also need different mechanisms. Uh, um, 
a lot of cases also the product is bigger so there's more to research um so the, the qualitative and the quantitative side you need to alter get others other systems in place and also other techniques um with smaller organizations for that you can uh, that's also the thing we advise you can use more lightweight mechanisms and tools um the funny thing is that talking to people um uh, it may sound old is the best way to do it just uh, go to your customer and uh, and talk to them uh, and we also do it with large organizations create uh, customer groups uh, get them around the table and ask them um that's the best way to do it Perfect. All right. With that being said, thank you so much, Mark, for your presentation. A lot of great insights in there. I, I took some notes, especially I like the, uh, the elephant and mouse analogy for, for heartbeat. Uh, so I appreciate your time and thanks so much for being here.